So this is part of the polypropylene lecture, uh, but what I'm going to talk about is additives. Um, and additives are added not just to polyolefins, but all resins. Uh, all thermoplastic resins, all thermoset resins. Uh, it would be cost prohibitive if you were to make a brand new polymer for every different application. And so the way we create something that's suitable for different applications is to take a base polymer, like polyethylene or polypropylene or what have you, and add additives in there. Um, so most, when you're talking about a resins formulation, you're talking about a recipe. So you have a base polymer, you have a wide variety of additives or fillers or whatnot, and that's what a formulation really means. Um, so these are added for both processing and products, so something that aids in processing, but something that also aids in the final product. So you get a better color or clarity in the product. You can also extend weatherability or impact resistance for a reduced cost than if you added a higher cost polymer or um, or, or a higher cost or something like that. Um, and you can add things in very very small amounts or make it the major component. There are some formulations I've worked with that have fillers that are that are more than 50%. So really, um, the polymer is a filler for the filler. If you understand what I'm talking about. So, a UV stabilizer. You might guess that if we are adding a UV stabilizer, we are trying to prevent photooxidation from heat and UV light. Uh, UV light is dangerous not only for people, but for polymers. Um, there are free radicals that are produced by UV light, and uh, those break carbon-carbon uh, bonds, and most of these polymers have a carbon-carbon backbone. So. Uh, a free radical will react with oxygen in the environment, it forms a peroxide, and that actually goes and breaks a carbon-carbon bond. And what you get as a result is a brittle, cracked plastic. So we can uh, stabilize things from UV a couple of different ways. We can block the UV light, or we can absorb the UV light before it generates free radicals, or we can give the free radical something else to react with as opposed to the polymer backbone. So when it comes to stabilizers, we the blockers that are typically used are the kind of low-cost fillers. And these are effective at pretty low loading, so they're not going to compromise your mechanical properties. They will change the appearance, but um, carbon black is a good one, and so is titanium dioxide. So just a little bit of those uh, can effectively block uh, UV. You also have UV absorbers, and these are the benzophenones, benzotriazoles, and these can be added in as low as 0.5%. You also have radical scavengers or radical traps, uh, hindered amine light stabilizers or HALs, and antioxidants. Polymers need antioxidants for the same reason people need antioxidants. So this is my little PSA. Take your multivitamin, uh, fight the free radicals. Uh, typically, these are all used together. So you might have a little bit of carbon black and a little bit of uh, benzotriazole and a little bit of, of HALs uh, to get the maximum impact for the minimum number of uh, additives and uh, cost of the additives. Some of these can be quite expensive, especially HALs. So this is a benzophenone. In terms of its structure, this is a benzotriazole. This is a azole right here. So these are some commercial uh, examples of the benzotriazoles. This is a house hindered amine light stabilizer. Why is it hindered? Well, this is an amine, and it has uh, this uh, big bulky group attached to it. So uh, you're you're blocking this amine sterically, so stuff can't get to it. Um, an antioxidant. This is a typical antioxidant structure. Uh, this is a, a dendritic antioxidant. has those little guys sticking off of it. Kind of looks like um, a little tree. Uh, heat stabilizers are also used. Uh, these are often organometallic carboxylates. Uh, this, these are derived from oils uh, or fats, and they are complexed with calcium ions. So this is a stearate. This is a, a, um, a stearate chain, and then it's complexed with a calcium. So these are very inexpensive. They can be derived very uh, easily. These are some uh, manufacturers UV stabilizers. If you've ever seen a commercial for BASF, you often see them say, we don't make the things, we make the things you buy better. They make a lot of the polymers or polymeric additives or colorants, things like that. So that's what BASF actually does. Clarient is another one in Great Lakes Chemical. If you work with a lot of additives, you'll see this one, this one, and this one quite a bit. Uh, flame retardants, as I mentioned before. Uh, a lot of polymers burn, and they burn well. They are fuel once they melt. Uh, this is uh, a real problem where we're previously, if you had a house made out of wood, uh, the wood would burn. Now the wood burns in all of the organic polymers that are used, and they produce very toxic byproducts like dioxins. So um, if, if you're in a, fi a house fire now, uh, the uh, smoke is extremely toxic. Uh, dripping burning plastic also is an accelerant, so it is very bad. 
Uh, so what do we do? How do we keep something from lighting itself on fire or bursting into flame next to a heat source? We can reduce fuel, oxygen, or heat. Uh, in reducing fuel, we reduce the low molecular weight volatiles that might be part of a formulation. We can improve the aromatic content. We can add oxygen and silicon, and we can create char. In other words, it doesn't burn, but it uh, blackens. Uh, not, not in the Cajun sense, but it, it blackens rather than burns. Uh, we can reduce oxygen. Uh, you need oxygen to burn. So something can have a non-flammable dense coating. A lot of uh, children's uh, clothing is, has a flame retardant layer. You can also add halogenated or phosphorus containing compounds. This is somewhat problematic. Uh, these are uh, environmentally frowned upon, and so a lot of the flame retardants try to avoid halogens or phosphorus, and a lot of uh, work is being done there. You can also reduce the heat. You can add a hydrated compound uh, to release water if it's heated up. So uh, you have hydrated aluminum oxides, or you have a non-combustible filler. So in other words, it won't burn. You can heat it up, but it won't burn. So fiberglass, other inorganic fillers. So these are some, this is a, a phosphorus containing one. Uh, this is a, a brominated one. Uh, you'll see these uh, frequently for enhancing flame retardants uh, in polymers as we go down the line. Clarifiers are also used. Uh, if you have something that's semi-crystalline, uh, the crystallites can be larger than the wavelength of light. So a light beam comes, hits a crystallite, bounces off, results in something that looks opaque. So what we want to do is we want the crystallites. Crystallites are important for tensile properties. But we want the crystallites to be really small so that instead of a light beam bouncing off, it scatters and still goes through. So um, we can increase the number of nucleation sites and we can force these spherulites to form on purpose instead of randomly. When they form randomly, they get really big. Bad for clarity. Form on purpose, they're smaller, and can increase clarity of the product. So um, here is uh, a normal polypropylene, a nucleated polypropylene. And uh, this appears to be a commercial, so, uh, but this is, this is the idea. So if you have something that's nucleated, you can create these sites, you get smaller crystallites. Uh, these are very large, will definitely scatter light. In this case, uh, this is clarified, and so uh, you do get some crystallization, similar to here, but they uh, remain very small. And this means that this remains clear, but still has crystallization present, it still has some increase in tensile strength. A uh, wide variety of manufacturers of flame retardants and clarifiers. Um, ExxonMobil makes quite a bit. SIBA, uh, do a lot with SIBA and the uh, additives. Uh, we're in the application section, which means we're in the home stretch for polypropylene. So polypropylene has very similar applications to polyethylene. Fiber and filaments, films, pipes, lots of carpet. Uh, for fibers are made from polypropylene, lots of polypropylene carpeting. Packaging, uh, automotive, trim, and battery cases. Uh, hinged packaging for commodity products, toys, bottle caps. So your bottle is probably PET, your bottle cap is probably polypropylene. Uh, once again, this is a very high quality graphic. And you're going to have to take my word for this, uh, but you can make a polypropylene foam. Again, if I had a better picture, this would be clearer. However, the one on the solid is a solid sheet material that's thermoformed. Uh, this one on the right is a foam, it's a foam sheet. And the nice thing about this is it weighs 25% less. Uh, it also costs a lot less to uh, ship it, so um, this would use less diesel fuel to haul than that. They'd all fit in the same space, but this is less weight. Polypropylene is often used in automobile parts, so green here is exterior, blue here is interior. So bumpers, dashboards, spoilers, uh, door panels, things like that. Um, uh, this looks an awful lot like my car, which is a Honda Fit, uh, which I swear is 97% plastic. Uh, it gets really, really good gas mileage, but um, if I have to go over, if I'm going at, at low speed, I really have to gun it to get over little rises. I mean, I, I don't have a lot of momentum because I don't have a lot of weight in the vehicle, and a lot of that has to do with the use of uh, plastic automobile parts. This is widely used for agricultural film, uh, at forestry, horticulture, landscaping, things like that. Uh, polypropylene is a lot used a lot in textiles and non-wovens. Textiles, text, there, there are, uh, it's a distinction to be made here. A, a textile is something that is woven. It might be a knit or it might be uh, woven, but it's something that has regular uh, uh, structure. A non-woven is a whole bunch of polypropylene fibers kind of squished together. Um, non-woven fabrics are designed for drainage, separation, and cushioning. Think baby diapers. 
Uh, te traditional textiles are uh, things that are used for, that need really good structural uh, uh, control. One of these uh, geotextiles that's used, this is for uh, stabilizing road embankments. So anywhere that there's a lot of erosion, uh, this is used to stabilize that and prevent erosion. This particular happens to be on the French island of La Réunion. I have no idea where that is. Uh, one example of this is the interchange outside of Web City, if you'd like to see something a little more local. Uh, it, most plastics are used in a lot of, say, leisure or sports applications. Uh, polypropylene has a big application in AstroTurf. It's also used in a lot of athletic gear. Um, the uh, dry yarn fiber was used in the Italian sail team's uh, Beijing Olympics uh, uniforms. And so uh, a lot of the wicking fabrics and things like that uh, are, are synthetic and polypropylene is one of the synthetic fibers. Uh, if any of you have kids or nieces or nephews, you will know the ubiquitous nature of plastic in children's toys and polypropylene is no exception. Uh, I deal with plastic all day at work, I go home and I trip over plastic at home with my daughter. Again, uh, pharmaceutical or healthcare bottles, they squeeze really nicely, they're really easy to process, they can get reasonable transparency, uh, and they're shatterproof. And so uh, it, that and in, in their re reduction in weight makes it really useful to use these rather than, say, glass or something like that. Uh, medical textiles are a big application of polypropylene, uh, blood bags and respirators uh, to medical textile products, so surgical gowns, uh, caps, masks, things like that. Uh, single use, you throw them away, they can be, they can be uh, put in sterile packaging prior to use. Uh, a lot of polypropylene is made into washers, uh, and because they have good chemical resistance, so they can be put into metering pumps that require resistance to chemicals. This concludes polypropylene. After this, we will be moving on to uh, the vinyls. See you then.